Please welcome to the stage Linda Mabena Ologunju of the DLO Energy Resources Group and our esteemed panel. Good afternoon, everyone. Has everyone got a seat? My name is Linda Mabena Olagunju, and I am from South Africa, and I'll be moderating this session. And the discussion points today are around the mining sector and the impact on climate and how we... Oh, let me just wait for everyone to take a seat before we continue. And basically, we're going to be looking at the various issues around mining for the green economy, the challenges this poses, the opportunities, and the, um, and the policy uh, and where the governments come into play. I'm going to allow my panelists to introduce themselves briefly before we delve into the questions. Hi, thank you. Uh, Christian Spano, I'm the director in charge of innovation of the International Council on Mining and Metals, uh, ICMM for short. And ICMM has been around for 20 years. It represents 30% of the market cap, uh, 650 sites around the world, uh, and is uh, governed by 25 CEOs that represent the largest mining companies in the world. If we think about innovation, uh, we're working across a number of topics, uh, but specifically in my portfolio, we focus on climate change, circularity, innovation in tailings, which is the main source, let's say, a, a limit, uh, source of waste from the mining industry, innovation in health and safety as we transition to a greener economy, and I'll, I'll leave it there to delve down uh, later today. Hi, I'm Sonia Scarcelli. I am the vice president of BHP Meta Exploration and also vice president of BHP Explorer. So today I want to focus a little bit more on talking about the BHP Explorer. It's a, a newly created accelerator. We run it for a year and the focus of the program is to support, grow and upscale early exploration company globally. We, we focus on multiple commodities uh, that uh, are uh, utilized, of course, for decarbonization and energy transition, uh, such as uh, copper, nickel, and so on. And our intent uh, is mainly to bring forward a uh, faster supply to the market in a more sustainable uh, and uh, with the ESG underpinning uh, at the base of uh, each of these opportunities. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jose Fernandez, Under Secretary of State. Uh, I'm in charge of. Uh, economic growth, energy, and the environment at the State Department. And one of the things that I'll, I'll, I'm involved in is critical minerals and rare earths. Thank you. Sonia, let me start with you. We've seen more recently around the world, especially in the Global South, issues coming up around uh, the mining sector, especially uh, those minerals that have to do with the clean energy sector. For example, we've seen in the DRC uh, the challenges in which you know uh, the mining environment is and we've obviously seen with the coup d'etat in um, Niger um, issues around uh, fair pay for those commodities etc one of the things that interested me when I was reading up about your explorer program is the fact that you are looking at a collaborative approach with working with local communities as well as local companies to build local uh, capacity for the mining sector. And that's one of the criticisms that have been leveled against large mining organizations that they leave behind the local players. Can you tell us a bit about the Explorer program and what it is you're looking to achieve through it at a more you know, long-term yeah. scale? Absolutely. So the, the intent of Explore program and the way it was uh, initiated and, and then executed uh, was uh, for, uh, for us to open up uh, to the 
the rest of the world, the globe, to new ideas, a new concept for exploration around the multiple jurisdiction. We did not have uh, a few areas of selection, but we wanted to, to have a global footprint. And with that, uh, we also recognized that there was um, an issue in the market itself on how we invest uh, on exploration companies uh, where we might provide the capitals, but we don't provide the support uh, to help the companies uh, to, to develop, uh, to grow, um, and to become better at what they're doing. And so the, the Explore program uh, became uh, this uh, new tool that could uh, yet offer the financial support, but also helping these companies to thrive. And how we've been doing that, we provide the mentorship, advising, we put them in com um, the companies itself in communication and contact with our experts, whether it's through safety, through um, how we, uh, we work with the local communities, uh, how we, we take in consideration uh, ESG, um, how we, um, we do proper planning for future mines. So often uh, these uh, small companies uh, don't have the resources, the capabilities, uh, and uh, the, the network to be able to, to build uh, sustainable mines, but because we provide that to them, uh, we help them to grow and uh, scale in a sustainable way. And with all of that, the Explore program to us offered the opportunity to see new projects around the world, but to those smaller miners offered the opportunity for them to actually build something that is, uh, is sustainable and can be brought forward. Jose, one of the things that is really important when companies, especially large companies represent, they become an identity of their governments from where they originate. What is your role from a governmental perspective in supporting, for example, American companies when they do go into these countries, perhaps where there is instability um, and perhaps where the economic terms for the mining is, is not equitable? What role do you think your government can play in making sure that we have a stable situation whereby companies are operating in a fair manner so that it doesn't lead to the current instability we're seeing, especially in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, look, I think one of the challenges that we see in, in the critical minerals, in the mining space in general, is there, there are perfectly viable projects that just cannot proceed because communities aren't convinced that it'll benefit them. So one of the things that we do is we, we make sure that our companies uh, understand that it's not only about extraction, it's about working with um, mining communities all around the world to, and, and to make it part of their practice. Something we've created, uh, and it's not just a U.S. initiative, it's the Mineral Security Partnership, 13 countries plus the EU, and there what we're doing is we're sharing information, we're sharing financing, uh, we're sharing investments, uh, we're going to work on recycling, and our calling card, uh, and we put this in black and white so that the world can judge us. Uh, uh, we are going to adhere to the highest ESG standards. Uh, and and that's, that's really, we cannot, something we have learned uh, along the way is we cannot engage in the race to the bottom. Uh, frankly, because we're not going to win a race to the bottom. And so w when I talk to our companies, I make sure that they understand what some of the things that we expect from them. And at the same time, we provide uh, support, we provide financing, uh, if necessary, we talk to governments about issues that might be facing these companies because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to deal with a vulnerability uh, right now where we're going to need exponentially more lithium, more manganese, more copper, and we've got to do so sustainably. You touched, um, Jose, a bit on innovation, and I, I want to you know, bring that to you from, a, from your sector. How are you assisting the local companies as well in which you operate to be m more innovative? Because what we tend to see is companies coming in, but there isn't a really high level of a skill transfer or an opportunity for them to participate in the innovation aspects of, um, of the extractive industries. So could you tell me a bit more about how you have in been inclusive within your process? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's a quite fundamental. Now, if people don't feel that it's inclusive, it's very difficult to think that anything is going to work no? for anybody. Mm -hmm. no? So it, that's, that's a starting point. I just wanted to pick up on something that, that Jose was saying, uh, is that this, this, this process of making sure that 
when when we talk about mining, you know, it's 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 something that brings together the communities and and whatever we talk about is it's not about the mining industry delivering to the mining industry, mm. but it's a, it's something that becomes not a promise but something very tangible and real. Uh, today in the morning, I was in a panel with energy companies, some still in oil and gas, some migrating to renewables, and some others in renewables. And I was sharing the the, the work that we're doing on on cleaner and safer vehicles. Now, when I say uh, cleaner and safer vehicles, people may think that I'm talking about station wagon or these vehicles in the mining industry are the size of a house. You know, uh, the energy that they need uh, can can uh, provide electricity, for example, or energy for 1,000 houses. So the the energy needs for these trucks is massive. We have 28,000 of these around the world. And we have committed, in ICMM, members have committed that these trucks are going to become zero emissions uh, by 2040. And this is ahead of a commitment that we have, again, as a membership, for the whole mining sector uh, members no, in the uh, ICMM, the 25 members, to become net zero by 2050. Uh, and so in this conversation, to, you get to the very granular on the ground. If you have a site and you have trucks that today are consuming diesel, and the whole value chain is in providing that diesel. Now you need megawatts of renewable electricity. You need you know, lots of green hydrogen uh, in place mm -hmm. to, once you have your uh, whole track uh, that needs that to, to run. If, if you do it in the right way, you know, the only way to build these local value chains, these local new value, is with local communities and with the local people, with the local governments, the regional governments at the end, the, the, the governments themselves. So this is a partnership, no? this transition. If you think about the global mining industry and what it means in terms of scaling the supply that we need to scale, and we think about making uh, the mining industry itself net zero by 2050, this is something that if we do it together with the renewable energy companies, with governments, with the mining companies itself, can really have a, a positive impact and legacy, a positive legacy locally. No? But you go back to engaging and understanding what is the lens that people want to work with mm. uh, and not coming and imposing uh, a one view. No? So far we've focused on the roles and responsibilities of your organizations, but I'm also very aware that there's challenges that you face, especially in operating in certain geographical areas. I mean, BHP used to be in Africa. They, they pulled out um, of Africa because of also some of the challenges, and we have to be realistic uh, about that. So briefly, because we, we are running out of time, unfortunately, and there's so much to unpack, but what are some of the challenges and what would make your jobs easier? Because as much as you've pulled out from Africa, we know that some of the highest quality of the resources come from that region, and you will not be able to avoid Africa forever, right? Um, so when you re-engage with the continent, especially in light of what we've seen happening um, in Niger, how do you see yourselves doing it differently? But more importantly, what support would you need from the governments there to, to address some of these challenges? This is a, f a great question. Uh, we actually are looking at opportunity in Africa. So through the Explore program, uh, we have invested on a company in, ba in Botswana. And then we're also been investing in uh, Tanzania with the Kabanga project. So that is our stepping back into the, the sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, for us, uh, what's, uh, there are a few things that are important. First of all, uh, we wanted to work in a place where there is a continuity of a regulatory framework and a permitting and approval where we don't see things changing all the time. If you think about the, the lifespan of a mine from the day we enter a permit and we explore to the day that, that becomes a mine, an operating mine and producer, in the past it was around 10, 15 years and now it's 15 to 20 years. So the time is almost doubled. Part of that is because things change consistently. So that, that for us is something we are looking for uh, consistency and continuity. But more than anything is the collaboration and is the partnership with the government. I, um, I really enjoyed my experience in Botswana and talking with the Minister of Resources and the Permanent Secretary for the Resources, where their, uh, their desire is really to create a partnership where the, the society is a part of deciding uh, what the mining will look like, how the mining uh, will impact what they're doing. It's not just the, the job, it's not just promising job, but becomes more uh, 
uh, a partnership that provide education or that, that, that help upscaling uh, the, the local communities as well. And I think that is a really important focus for us uh, going forward as we are operating in Africa and maintaining that, uh, that relationship going forward. Uh, that, that has to be the key. You know, producing countries all over the world realize that this is a once in a generation opportunity. The clean energy transition means 42 times the amount of lithium by 2050, just to give you an example. They want to take advantage of this, but at the same time, they don't want to have to sacrifice uh, human rights uh, and their environment in favor of economic growth, whatever mirage that might be. So they're looking for alternatives. So our job, I think, as a government uh, and for our companies is to be able to convince these countries that we can provide alternatives, that they don't have to make that false Faustian choice. Uh, and that the, you, you're getting a good audience there. I think, uh, in, be it in Asia, not just Africa, be it Asia, Latin America, or in Africa, uh, governments are looking for alternatives. Somebody they realize is going to develop these resources. They want to do it right. They don't want to engage in, in activities that will lead to a, a resource curse. So at least in my experience, uh, we're getting a good audience. And uh, it, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. Okay. I, I just think that we, we tend to think that um, this could be a, a bad scenario where the mining industry can go and do it the bad way or a good scenario where we have a just transition. I don't think it, if the perception is that there's not going to be a good scenario and it's not credible, I mean, local communities and local governments are simply not going to uh, allow that extraction to happen. It's not, that supply will not exist. Not only we need to make sure that we bring our message very clearly that the intention is to do it sustainably and to do it in a way that is innovative, but it needs to be believed and we need to deliver to that promise constantly, daily, so that that credibility comes up every day and it's something that people can actually see and touch. If we get into that discipline that we're already doing, if you, I can name you a number of examples, but we have two minutes. Mm -hmm. um, if we make that the norm and we build that capital of credibility over time, and we bring people together, this is a one in a lifetime uh, and a decade opportunity that could really transform the lives uh, of not only those building the wind farms in, in Europe and the US and the developed world, but also those resource rich countries that you know, uh, also deserve a just transition. I think one thing we can't deny is that there is definitely going to be global competitiveness around these resources. And with that comes the, uh, its own challenges um, as well as, com as countries compete uh, for those resources. And I think we, we can't deny, uh, as you touched on, Jose, the, the generations of the resources curse that we've had. And as we enter this new surge for the renewable energy market and the demand on minerals, it's important to reflect on the lessons learned, especially from the oil and gas sector and previously in the mining sector as well. And um, I do hope that we do things differently this mm -hmm. time around. But thank you very much for, for your time. Um, it was a very short panel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I enjoyed your, your insights. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.